Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. There's a new hero in town. Uh, Nope, not that guy. Nope, not him. Not uh, that guy. He's a hero with a dad bod. This father figure may not have six-pack abs, but he's got something even better. A heart of gold. He may love donuts, but he goes nuts for his family. Whether it's helping with homework or saving the day. So don't let the dad bod fool you. Real dads are their true heroes, both inside and out. Oh, man. How you doing, church? Wow, way better than the first service crowd. I just wanted to say that out loud. I mean, look at you. Um, We're going to be digging into a deep topic today. But um, speaking of deep, um, I was just down in Homer this past weekend. Well, actually, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, um, came back yesterday, last night. Uh, My wife's out of town right now. She's out visiting her sister, um, celebrating her sister's 50th birthday, enjoying sunshine and warm weather, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and, uh, and so they're out there. So I took the girls. I don't think my girls have gone to bed before midnight since Kitri left. So that's not good. Um, but they're alive, and that's good. So I'm, I feel like I'm winning on a bunch of fronts. Um, but we're down in Homer to help my parents put their boat in the water. Um, and they have an, a boat they bought years ago. Uh, it's been in dry dock for a little while. And it's a boat that like has to be lifted out with the big travel lifts, you know, and then carried over to dry dock. Um, I don't know if you know this. Boats are expensive <laughs> and frustrating. And especially if they've been out of the water for a couple of years, and then you go to put them back in the water, you just want to know they're not going to sink. And what I've discovered is that you can do everything in your power to make sure everything's taken care of, and you don't know until the boat's in the water whether it is or not. We found out fairly quick. In fact, as I'm backing the boat out of the straps that the travel lift drops you in with, um, and we're about a half mile away from uh, where we got put in, um, we decided we should just check downstairs and lifted the hatch down to the engine room, and smoke is billowing out because the engines are overheating, because the coolant system has ruptured, because salt water is pouring into the boat, which, if you don't know, isn't good. (laughs) Anyways, um, and so calmly and collectedly, we turn around and start heading back and saying, please come back and take us out of the water. I think the topic today that we're dealing with, this issue of forgiveness, is kind of like that. You think you've done all the work to get ready, but it isn't until you're actually in the situation, when that thing comes back up or that issue arises again or their name is mentioned, that you actually know if you've dealt with the issues. What we want to talk about today is how do I forgive? Not how do I say the words I forgive, which if you grew up in the South, you know that you're supposed to say, right? Bless your little heart, I forgive you. But saying I forgive you and forgiving are two entirely different things. Amen? Amen. So we're going to jump into that. Um, And over the past couple of weeks, if you've missed the previous two messages in this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. Um, But we're going to deal with the topic of forgiveness today and specifically why it matters for men and in particular fathers to be forgivers. Now, everyone should forgive, right? That was pretty weak, but it's true. Um, Everyone (laughs) should (laughs) Forgive, uh, but there's something unique that happens when men participate in this act of forgiving, which brings me to Bucket Brigade. I want you to imagine with me for a moment um, a story. I'm going to name the guy Leroy because I just I don't know anybody here who's named Leroy. If your name is Leroy, I'm sorry. It was a total accident. Anybody named Leroy? Oh, sorry, Leroy. Um, <laughs> Lee Ross. Lee. 
Leroy. I'll just go with Leroy. How about, okay, let's just stick with Leroy because otherwise I'll get all confused. But let's just imagine for a moment, um, Leroy, when he was a young boy, about eight years old or so, uh, mom and dad were together. They had been together for a really long time um, and he was super happy that they were together, but they were having some arguments and they were increasing in frequency. And one day, all Leroy remembers is he's out in the front yard playing and mom comes storming out of the house with her suitcase. She gets in her car and she leaves. Now, she came back a little while later, just a couple of weeks later, actually, but in Leroy's eight-year-old mind, mom abandoned them in that moment, and something happened to Leroy in that moment. He began to believe that he could not trust women. Fast forward, and Leroy begins to develop some real issues with relating to women, in particular women in authority in his life, like his teacher in elementary school or his principal in junior high, and he found himself just incessantly rebelling against, in particular, female authority in his life. And you fast forward, and the day comes when Leroy discovers that even though he has problems with the feminine sex, he also really would like to get married. Like, he enjoys the companionship, he wants the relationship, and he meets this gal in college. She's the one. He knows she's the one. He's a little bit apprehensive, a little bit scared, but they decide to get married, and they do. They get married, and they are off on the journey of life. But it doesn't take long at all before Leroy starts to be suspicious. Maybe he sees things happening that he thinks, that's just like my mom. That's how she was. But he doesn't really recognize it as that. He thinks it's justified suspicion. And so he begins to react and respond in ways that actually are more and more controlling in that relationship. And eventually in that relationship, she gets so frustrated, she actually does find another man and she betrays him and abandons him. And now the deal is sealed. He knows he cannot trust women. But he's lonely. He still wants to be in a relationship. He still wants to share that kind of affection. He still wants to be with someone. He happens to meet someone along the way, and they seem to have a similar story to him because they don't trust men. Now, well, then let's get together. And they do, and they get married. And it seems like it's going really well for a little while until certain things start to creep up, and he becomes more and more suspicious. He's certain that that's just like what happened here and here and here, and he knows that he can't trust this person. And he becomes more and more angry. At least anger is the emotion he's expressing He starts to do things like when he's angry, punching holes in the wall or kicking in a door or those kinds of things. It's becoming more and more violent over time, and she's becoming more and more afraid over time. And eventually, she decides that she is unsafe. She can't be in this situation, and so she and the kids pack up, and they're gone. They're out of here. They're not staying in this situation any longer, and he comes unhinged. All of his greatest fears have been confirmed yet again. He hasn't connected all the dots that we're connecting right now. He just knows that it's true. He can't trust women, and so he goes out of his mind. He drinks all the alcohol he can find in the house. He jumps in his old Ford pickup truck. Fortunately, it starts because Fords usually don't. And then he... I don't even know where that came from. Uh, And he takes off into town and their little community. And he's running over stop signs. I mean, he's just terrorizing the neighborhood. And he ends up burying the front of his truck into the convenience store right there in town. And of course, he's not going anywhere. And the police show up. Just so happens it's a female police officer. That doesn't go well. I know all about you. And after assaulting a police officer and finally getting into cuffs and into the back of the car, and now he's in jail and he's wondering how in the world did I end up here? And there he sits, pondering his life, thinking about the situation that he's gotten himself into, wishing it wasn't like this. Really what he's carrying at this moment is a sense of guilt and shame. I'm embarrassed that I behaved the way that I did. I wish I'd done something different. I wish I wasn't in this situation. This is going to show up in the paper, and you know how things are in a small town when they show up in the paper. And he's actually really carrying around, if you could imagine, a bucket, and that bucket is full of guilt and shame, and it is weighing him down. He comes before the judge, and the judge says, you're a knucklehead. You got some issues. I know I got some issues. Here's what I'm going to recommend. Your sentence is you got to do community service, right? You got to pay a fine to repair the things that you're broke, and then you also need to go and see an anger management specialist. You, you need to go and see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or somebody. You need to get some help is what you need. And Leroy's like, tell me about it. 
And so he shows up for his first appointment, and they begin to ask him a series of questions, and they unpack all the stuff we just unpacked about his life story, his background, his upbringing. And the counselor begins to tell him things like this. Hey, you need to understand something. I can tell you where that sense of distrust came from. Your mom abandoned you, and that's why you've had a hard time trusting. And I'll tell you something. When you can first figure out who you need to blame, it feels pretty good. And he's carrying all of this weight, all of these rocks, if you would imagine them, in this bucket of guilt and shame. And his counselor's now helping him identify where it came from, who's responsible. And our generation in particular has gotten really good at blaming the previous generations for all of our own behaviors and mistakes. And so he begins adding rocks to his blame bucket now, and it feels nice to be balanced to be re-centered, to not be leaning over, carrying all this weight, and to sort of be balanced out again. I'll tell you, when you first figure out where the wounds and offenses came from in the past that caused the ways that you behave and react now, it feels really good. But here's the problem. They haven't taken any weight off of Leroy. They just added some to him. He was carrying around all this guilt and shame, and now he knows who to blame for it, and he feels balanced, but he's still loaded down with weight. And what he really needs is to figure out how to get rid of the guilt and the shame and how to forgive the wounds and offenses that have come in life in order to be really free, to not be a slave. In Colossians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages in recent years, there's this description of what Jesus did for you and I. Because the solution to Leroy's problem is amazingly simple. It's this, repent and forgive. In other words, experience forgiveness and extend forgiveness. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? And this passage in Colossians describes what Jesus did for you and I. Here's what it says. You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all all our sins. Can you say all our sins? sins. That's a bunch for most of you. (laughs) All our sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. We haven't even gotten to the resurrection of Jesus yet. Like on the cross, he canceled all of the debt that you and I were carrying because of our sin, because of our offenses. All of it, all sin for all time was covered on the cross. And not only that, but he took those people who were heaping blame and guilt and shame on you, and he actually disarmed them. He took away their power, and he took away their voice, and he took away their authority. That's the reality of what Jesus did. And here's what I've discovered over the years. The more I fixate on what Jesus did for me, the more difficult it becomes for me to hold an offense against you. The more I understand what Jesus has actually done for me, the greater challenge I actually have in holding something against you. I'm not speaking hypothetically. I'm telling you what's happening in my life. The older I get, the better I know myself, the better I know my weaknesses, and the more I understand the message of the gospel, the good news, it becomes harder and harder for me to hold on to offenses against others. In this back room uh, um, where I sit usually before service and just going over my notes and stuff, we have a cross in there with a crown of thorns on it. And I often imagine myself kneeling at the foot of the cross and saying to Jesus as he's hanging there, bloody and beaten, almost unrecognizable, the life seeping out of him as he hangs there. I often imagine myself kneeling down there and saying, Jesus, can you believe what they did to me? And how silly that would be in that moment. And I would say this also, when it comes to fathers and their willingness to forgive, there is something about your role as a man and as a father and as a husband that you display the heart of the father in a unique way when you're willing to forgive and show mercy instead of demanding justice. When fathers extend forgiveness rather than demanding justice, they uniquely model the heart of the father to those around them. And here's why. We're all responsible to forgive, but the reality is, in my kids' eyes, their dad can beat up your dad. 
It actually doesn't matter whether you really could or not, but that's what those in our family believe about us, right? I mean, my girls are like, I know my dad could beat up your dad. It doesn't matter if it's true. In my case, it happens to be, but <laughs> whatever, right? Like, that's what they fundamentally believe. And from that position of power, that I could demand justice in this situation, that I could be angry enough, I could get after it and make them pay. And when I choose to forgive and show mercy, I actually model something about the most powerful being in all the universe who could demand justice for every wrong that's been done against him, and yet he chooses to offer mercy and forgiveness. I uniquely display the heart of the Father as a father when I'm willing to forgive and show mercy instead of demanding justice. Mm, That's a good word. I know. It'll preach all day, all by itself. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to forgiveness, you could not pick a theme that is more paramount in the scriptures. From the beginning of the story, Adam and Eve and the fall in the Garden of Eden, all the way to the moment when Jesus lays down his life, forgiveness is the overarching theme of the story. And that's why it matters so much to you and I, which brings me to slave labor. Church on the Rock exists for a specific purpose. If you've ever been through our Ascent class, you know exactly what it is. I'm sure you memorized it. You have it tattooed up on your shoulder. Not the low back, that's gross, but up on your shoulder. Like, here it is. Church on the Rock exists to develop people who love, live, and lead like Jesus. And here's what we mean by that, that we love God and we love others, that we live in freedom in Christ, and that we lead others to that same freedom in Jesus. We lead them to Christ. And when you fixate on this piece, live in freedom, and you ask the question, how do I live in freedom? I actually believe forgiveness is one of the primary ways. Several years ago, I made a trek through um, Sri Lanka. I started in um, Colombo and then went up to the uh, border at the time of northern Sri Lanka where the Tamil Tigers had control and then went from there to Thailand, Bangkok, and then up to uh, the Burmese border. Um, then went from there to southern India and then to northern India, um, Kolkata, Sonagachi, brothel sector. We were looking into the issues of human trafficking, bonded slave labor, and sex slavery, and organizations that we could partner with as a church. And as I made that trek, there was a particular organization called International Justice Mission, which is probably doing some of the greatest work, not just in the Christian circle, but period, in the area of addressing human trafficking in the world. And so we had connected with International Justice Mission before in India. They have offices all over the world, and their offices are in these nondescript locations and buildings. There's no sign out front that says International Justice Mission because the people that they're putting out of business are serious people. And so you have to be led to their offices, and they buzz you into this little room, and in this little room, there's a camera, and there's somebody asking you a couple of questions, and they buzz you through that. And when you go through that door into the next room, it is just a hub of activity. Lawyers, advocates, ex-military individuals, local police and law enforcement, all working together to address human trafficking issues, in particular in Chennai, bonded slave labor. And we just happened to show up this time on a day they were getting ready to do a raid. And so they were whiteboarding the raid. They had everyone um, there in the room, local law enforcement, their military individuals, their lawyers, all of that were present in the room. And they were kind of describing, here's how the event's going to go. Here's who's going in first. Here's where we're going to enter the facility. I'll never forget the lady who was organizing the operation. I'll never forget what she said as we were sitting there with her. She said, often the most difficult thing as part of a liberation project like this, often the most difficult thing is convincing someone who's been liberated that they were actually a slave to begin with. Oh no, I'm not a slave. I've lived here my whole life. This is my boss. This is who I work for. Well, yes, I owe a debt to them, and they just take the money that I make working for them, and they pay my debt off. They have no idea that they're being extorted. They have no idea they could live any other way. She said, often the most difficult part when you're freeing someone is convincing them that they were actually a slave to begin with. And I thought, how would we know if we were slaves? How would you know if you were in bondage right now? In particular, in this area of bitterness and unforgiveness because it is a bondage. It is robbing you. I'm not talking about um, sort of the, the surface things. I'm addicted to pornography, or I drink too much, or whatever it is. I'm talking about the things that cause those things, the things that lead us to self-medicate. How would you know if you were in bondage 
to those things. And I thought about some of the questions that you would ask someone who is being liberated in a bonded slave labor or a sex slavery situation. And they're things like this. Number one, um, circumstances that I'm in are outside of my control. I feel powerless to change things. In other words, it's not my responsibility. They need to come and ask for forgiveness. I can't change the situation. They have to change the situation. I can't get out of the situation I'm in because they're the one who did the wrong. You actually begin to believe that you don't have control of the situation you find yourself in emotionally or physically. The second thing is there's a debt that's owed. Like somebody's incurred a debt, and until they pay that debt back, we can't go anywhere. We can't do anything. That there's a debt that is somehow involved, and someone needs to pay for it. The third thing is this, you feel the need to justify your actions and your attitudes. Well, I have every right to feel this way. I have every right to talk about them like this. I have every right to post this on social media. You should hear what they said to our friends. And you begin to justify your own actions and attitudes, even though in a moment of rational thinking, you would know that just isn't the right way to engage. You begin to justify them. And the fourth thing is this, that you actually can't even envision a different way of living. Like, I've lived this way so long. I've held on to this so long. I can't even imagine what it feels like to live without this. That in some strange way, it's become a comfort blanket to you. That if I let go of this, what do I have? If I let go of this, what place do I have in the world? What right do I have? That I can't actually see a different way of living. I believe the two most destructive and deceptive bondages we can find ourselves in are these, the bondage of guilt and shame and the bondage of unforgiveness. I actually believe that you and I can step out of those today. Like any time we would choose to step out of that, that a pathway has been provided to experience freedom from those things. But I want to give some definitions before I give some direction. Is that all right? Because I think often we get really confused, and the church has not done a great job of actually describing what forgiveness is and what it is not. The areas in which I should extend forgiveness and the areas in which I actually can't even extend forgiveness. And I want to break forgiveness into three categories. I want to break it into what I call personal forgiveness, judicial forgiveness, and eternal forgiveness. Because I think for many of us, we grew up believing that if I forgive this offense, it means that there are no consequences, or it means that I must enter back into relationship with this person, and therefore it's terrifying to consider forgiving something when I can't have any boundaries, when I have to trust them again, I have to put myself back in harm's way, or justice can't be served. It actually doesn't mean any of those things. We're talking about three different types of forgiveness, and I want to start with personal. And here's how I would describe personal forgiveness. I actually do have the power and the responsibility to forgive in this area of personal offense. And the reality is that you and I not only have the responsibility, but Jesus makes available the power if you're willing to step into it. And Peter asked this question of Jesus. I can only imagine when Peter asked the question in Matthew chapter 18 that Peter's actually probably talking about one of the other disciples I'm guessing it's Thomas, could be Judas, who knows? I'm sure Peter's offended plenty of the other disciples anyways. But Peter asked Jesus this question in Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came and he asked Jesus, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? This is a question I think my girls are always asking me. And they're like, my sister has done this 10 Brazilian times. It's not a real number, but anyways, it sounds like a lot. My my sister keeps, how many times do I have to forgive her? How about, I'll throw a number out. It seems like a lot. I forgive them seven times. Not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Just so you don't have to, you know, get your wheels spinning and smoke coming out your ears. That's 490 times. But it actually isn't about the number. It isn't about the 490. What Jesus is describing, because he's using the 7 and the 70, is he's saying as many times as it takes, completeness, fullness, wholeness, however many times it takes, how many times would you like to be forgiven for something? You just keep forgiving. You can only imagine Peter walking away like, 
that's a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. What if they keep doing it? You keep forgiving in this area of personal forgiveness, which doesn't mean I have to keep trusting them. It doesn't mean I have to stay in this relationship. It doesn't mean I have to keep putting myself in harm's way, but dealing with the issue of my heart and actually forgiving them, I do actually have a responsibility to that. And here's what's crazy. It doesn't actually matter if you're the one who's been offended or you are the offender. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon Jesus preaches that we have recorded, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching and he says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar, I'll put it in our context, you showed up for worship on a Sunday, you're about to give in the offering, or you're about to lift your hands in worship, or any of those sorts of things, but you've shown up to sacrifice to the Lord in some way, a sacrifice of praise or financial, you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against against you. Like it dawns on you, oh man, there's that thing between me and them, and I've never dealt with it. I've never made it right. I've never made restitution. I've never apologized for it. That there's something between you and someone else. I don't want your gift. I actually have something I would prefer, the Lord says. He says, leave your gift there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Go and make it right. If the opportunity is available, I know there are some things that we've done and that person is nowhere to be found or that person has passed away and I can't go and make it right. But he says, if you can, go and pursue reconciliation because I value that restored relationship more than I value your sacrifice and your offering and your gift. This is more important to God that we make those relationships right when we have the opportunity to do so. Whether we've been offended or we are the offender. That's the personal area of forgiveness. But this other area, judicial forgiveness, here's how I would describe it. I may not have the power nor the responsibility to forgive this. I'll give you an example. It's an extreme example for sure, but in the case of abuse of a minor, A child has been abused physically, sexually. It doesn't really matter, but abuse of a minor, I actually don't have the right to withhold that information. I actually have a responsibility to turn that over to the judicial system so that it can be dealt with. And there's nothing unforgiving about doing that. That I can actually personally forgive. I can actually personally pursue reconciliation at whatever level is appropriate or healthy and report someone to the authorities. But if you believe that those two things are actually joined together, you may tend to withhold forgiving because you believe it means they get off with no consequences. Well, all I'm recognizing is that I'm not the one responsible to bring the consequences. I can entrust that to God ultimately, and the scriptures describe that we're supposed to entrust that to authorities temporally or here and now. And I know how much Alaskans love authorities, but let me just read this passage to you in Romans 13, four through five. The authorities, here it is, are God's servants sent for your good. Just next time you get pulled over and they're gonna give you a ticket or you get profiled on the street, just lead with this. Hey, I want you to know, I know that you are God's representative designed to bring about my good. It's weird, but... um, just give it a try. It's, it's what he's, now, here's what he's not saying. He's not saying all authorities behave in this way. In fact, when they don't, the issue of justice or judicial actually needs to be leveraged against unrighteous authorities, right? But he is saying that they're in a place and they are designed to bring about good. For they have the power to punish you. You should not be afraid. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. In other words, there are things I have to take my hands off of. Vigilante justice is not the way to go, even if I could bring it. Because there's an issue of the heart that is actually far more critical than the issue of justice. God sees God will deal with, even if the judicial system doesn't, he is a God of justice. And the third one is this, eternal. And in this one, I actually do not have the power over this. 
but I should hope that they experience it. I'll tell you, this is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to forgiveness, is in this moment when that name comes up, when somebody tells you about them, when it comes up in conversation. And and what if somebody said to you, man, they showed up at church last week, or they better not show up at my service. They showed up at church last week. I saw them raise their hand. They're going to get baptized. Well, I hope God can forgive them because I can't. I hope they burn in hell. When that sort of response comes up in that moment, rather than hope that they could experience eternal restoration, something is still broken in here. It doesn't mean I have to enter back into that relationship. That may never be healthy or appropriate. I can set boundaries. I can determine what is good for me and what isn't good for me. I can determine what level of relationship I can and can't have. But the hope that they could experience this one, the eternal restoration, is actually critical to your own freedom. It's crazy. Maybe you've heard people say it before, like holding on to bitterness, holding on to unforgiveness is actually like drinking poison and hoping they die from it. It's exactly what it is. In most cases, more often than not, they are not being affected by your bitterness at all. They blocked you off of Facebook a long time ago, or they don't care what you have to say or whatever. They got their own circle of friends or whatever it is, but we keep holding on to those things. And it's like drinking poison, hoping that the poison kills them, but it's killing you. And Jesus wants you to be free from it and to trust that he can deal with everything else. And I want to be in a position where I hope for, I long for, even for those who have offended me the greatest, that they could experience this eternal forgiveness. In fact, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, looking down at his murderers because he is guiltless. He is sinless in this moment. The ones who hung him there, the ones who beat him beyond recognition, the ones who put him on the cross, and he looks down at them. And in Luke 23, verse 34, these are his words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the path that they're on. They don't know where they're at. I would plead for them, their case, that you would forgive them. Father, they don't know what they're doing, and they gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. I can only imagine, right, if you're Jesus and you're looking down, you have compassion and pity and you want forgiveness for them and you plead to the Father on their behalf. They're the ones who put me here, but I'm asking you to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And then they look up one more time and they spit on me and then they begin to throw the dice. I'll get to take his clothes home because he ain't going to be wearing them. Okay, never mind, Father, kill him now. 70 times 7. You and I, we get to uniquely model the heart of Jesus when in that moment, when the offense is happening again, we still hope and pray that they would experience the eternal forgiveness of the Father. It's actually a way we uniquely model the person of Jesus. This passage in 1 Corinthians 13, I think has been one of the confusing ones over the years. We call it the love chapter. You read through it, and you read all the descriptions of what love is, and you're like, I got some work to do. But there's one description in there. If you read it in the NIV when you were younger, it actually has the wrong word. It's misunderstood. Almost every other translation, I feel like, gets it right. But in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, I'll just read through it so that you can feel guilty all over again for how poorly we're loving one another. Love is patient and kind. It's just me and my girls over the past few days. I need to work on this one. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And here's the passage. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. If you read it in the NIV, it says love always trusts which can be a terrifying prospect when you're talking about forgiveness, especially when it's someone who has harmed you or harmed those you love. But it actually never said trust. It says hopes, believes. That ability, no matter what the situation was, that I in my heart could hope for them to experience restoration. I'll tell you, as an adoptive parent, through the foster care system, through that process, knowing everything I know about biological parents and all of those kinds of things, the Lord walked me through 
this process that my job was to never vilify them, to never paint them in a terrible light, to recognize their hearts are breaking, they don't love the way they're living, to cheer for them, to hope for them, to believe for them, to contend for them, and that my daughters needed to see me live that out so that they would know what it looked like to always hope, to always believe. When I could choose resentment, I could choose being the good guy. It's a big deal. Which brings me to common core and Jesus math. Matthew 18, right after Peter asked this question, how many times do I have to forgive? Jesus follows up his answer with a parable. Let me just illustrate it for you, Peter. This is the parable that he tells them starting in verse 23. He says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Say, millions of dollars. You didn't have to say it weird like that. I don't movie popped into my head all of a sudden. Millions of dollars, that's a lot of dollars, uh, and he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold, which was the master's right to do, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay his debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave the debt. Imagine, like, like, this isn't like your credit card bill. If you've got millions of dollars on your credit card, one, I don't know how you got that card, but you never should have been given it. And it's like maybe your house mortgage or like whatever it is, but like some insurmountable amount that you can't even conceive of having covered, and it's forgiven like that. Not just are you released from the debt, released from being in prison, but the debt is forgiven and you don't have to pay it. Like, how many of you would love for that to happen tomorrow with your mortgage? Yes. Oh, let's just pray right now. For, okay. <laughs> now, here, here's what happens. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Say a few thousand dollars. Yeah, that's less than a few million. Just in case you're a lot less than a few million. It owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it. It should have rung his bell in this moment. This sounds familiar, but it didn't. Be patient and I will repay it, he pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. I can only imagine. There's an interesting side note in here, by the way. He has his fellow servant imprisoned and put there until the debt can be paid. He actually hinders his ability to pay the debt. He's actually going to hold on to it longer now. Have you ever had that experience where, now I'm terrified if I let them out of prison, if I forgive this, but it's actually going to be payment in full for you. You're going to release the debt, but you believe putting them in prison will somehow make them pay it faster, and I'm telling you, it doesn't. He puts them in prison until it can be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king, and they told him everything that had happened. And then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, You're a moron. You evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. You repented. You asked. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt is a big deal to God. Our willingness to model what we've experienced, and granted, some of you in this room may have never experienced the forgiveness the Father actually has for you. Don't get me wrong. You may have prayed the prayer, but what I can tell you for a fact, when you feel forgiveness from God, when you get a taste of what that's actually like, it becomes increasingly difficult to hold offenses against others. I'll tell you, my grandmother, my nanny, 
was always amazed at the level of joy she had. And as I got older and older, I realized she had been through some stuff in life. As an American Indian, Mississippi Choctaw, growing up on a reservation in Oklahoma, going to an Indian school and all the stuff that comes with all of that, and then going back to Tennessee, marrying a white guy whose family completely disowned him when they got married because they wanted nothing to do with that Indian woman. And he was a drunkard as well. And whenever he'd get drunk, he'd yell out at her around his friends, hey, squaw, give me something to eat. And as I began to understand more and more of her story, I was more and more shocked that she wasn't bitter. She wasn't angry, that she wasn't holding out this offense against somebody who owed her something. And what I discovered over time is that when she was a little girl, she had met Jesus. Not that she had prayed the prayer, she had met Jesus. Like she had experienced his kindness in her life, his forgiveness in her life, and she wasn't carrying anything around because it wasn't worth carrying around. And she knew what forgiveness looked like, and so she modeled it to my dad and to me and to everyone in our family. It's what it's supposed to look like. Here's what I want to say. You got to be careful not to get the cart before the horse. I know, I know. It's so tempting when someone identifies that you're carrying around an offense, right? It's a good friend of yours. And they're like, hey, I just want you to know you're still bitter at them. I am not bitter at them. I forgive them. Forgiveness isn't words. It's attitudes and actions. And the reality is I think there's some work that has to be done, some prerequisites, some prep work, so that we can actually forgive when the moment comes. And here are the things that I believe are necessary. There's four of them. Hunger, honesty, humility, and hope. We've covered them, but I just want to recap. Here's what I mean when I say hunger. There actually has to be something that you hunger for more than revenge and restitution. There has to be something you hunger for more than getting back at them. It has to be peace. It has to be relationship with Jesus at a deeper level than you've ever known. It has to be modeling the gospel in your own life. It has to be something that you hunger for more than revenge and retribution, freedom and relationship and righteousness and peace in my own heart and in my own mind. And then honesty. You and I have to be willing to identify the real offense. It isn't that they stole money from you. It isn't that you gave them a second chance and they were coming out of addiction and you let them stay in your home and now they've stolen from you something that was precious to you. That's the surface thing. The offense is a betrayal. It's a broken trust. It's a, but you got to identify. You got to be honest. You got to be able to peel the onion back and say, here's the thing that really hurt because that's the thing that you actually have to be willing to forgive. Here's the real offense, the core offense, because that's where the healing is needed. And then humility. This one is so important. You have to just be willing to admit that you need forgiveness as much as they do today. Not I needed. I'll tell you, one of the things that moves you out of judgmentalism faster than anything else is the recognition that today I need the blood of Jesus to be shed for my life. Today I need forgiveness. Today I got it wrong. And that recognition produces humility in you and I to admit our own need. And the last one is hope, that I must be willing to believe, to pray for, to contend for their restoration and relationship to Jesus. And if possible, restoration and relationship together. Sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't healthy, but it should be the desire of my heart. I invite you to stand with us. I'm going to move into a time of communion now. I couldn't think of a better topic to be stepping into communion over than this topic in particular. In Hebrews chapter 12, it's an interesting passage, and you need the backstory in order to understand what he's saying. And if you've ever read the beginning of the story in the Bible, in Genesis, the uh, first two boys that are born, Cain and Abel, Maybe you've heard somebody say before, it's like raising Cain, right? Like Cain and Abel. And a moment came where there was an offense. Cain was really offended at God, but his brother was the target because God had accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. And Cain wasn't at all happy about this. And it wasn't actually because of what he offered. It was because of how he offered it. And so one day they're out in the field together just chatting along. I can only imagine after watching my girls for a season, like somebody said something, they got under his skin. 
And Cain decided he was going to kill his brother in that moment, in an act of passion, but deliberate. And he picks up a rock and he clubs him in the head and he kills him. And God shows up on the scene and he says to Cain, yo, where's your brother at? How am I supposed to know? Am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes. You actually are in many ways, but you know exactly where he is, don't you? In fact, God says, I can hear the blood of Abel crying out from the ground for vengeance, for justice. He was done wrong and it must be made right. In that context, here's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24 says, you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel did. That the blood of Jesus spilled for you and I, instead of crying out for vengeance, for retribution, for a price to be paid, says, I will pay the price. You and I, when we forgive, we actually model that same thing. Someone may owe a debt. It may be a perceived offense, or it may be a real offense. I discover the older I get, when I think back about my family and things I think somebody got wrong, I recognize I just perceived it, but it doesn't matter because it's actually an offense I've been carrying. And when I'm willing to forgive those things, I actually model what Jesus did for me. That while he could have cried out for vengeance, he cries out for mercy for you and I. And that's why whenever we come to communion, this moment, it's actually a celebration because it's a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. That's why he says, as often as you drink this cup and you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of my death, not his resurrection. That's a party all by itself, but Good Friday, Good Friday is good all by itself also because it's the moment when all of the debts were canceled, when all of it was wiped out. It was your declaration of independence moment that you could be free if you just believed it, if you would step into it. And so while he's at the table with his disciples, one of whom is about to betray him and Jesus knows it full well, His death is coming, betrayal is coming. And while he's there at the table, he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, here's what this represents. It's my body, which is broken for you. Take it and remember my sacrifice. takes the cup that is there at the table as well. He says, this cup is a new covenant. A new covenant in my blood. All sin for all time will be covered. Forgiveness has been extended. You and I get to decide whether we will step into it, whether we will accept it, whether we'll allow it to be applied to our lives, but it's already been done. All sin for all time has already been covered. And as often as you eat that bread and you drink this cup, I want you to do it in remembrance of me until I come back for you. Let's take the cup together. Amen. (laughs) Jesus, we just say thank you. We say thank you for the full and final work that you performed. But more importantly, I pray today that it would settle in our hearts in a way that causes us to long to forgive others, that there would actually be something we hunger for more than revenge, more than retribution. There would be something that we actually can describe we desire more than we desire those things, and that it would lead us to a place of actually hoping for those who have offended us that they would experience forgiveness as well. God, would you take this message? Would you take these frail words and would you cause them to do only the thing that you can and that is bear fruit in our lives? And I pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Prayer ministry teams are going to be available on both sides, church. Hey, God bless you. Have a great 4th of July weekend. You are dismissed. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play.